Thank you very much, Thank Dr. You. Spear. Can Dr. Uh, Stephen Phillips please come to the podium? Thank you. So my name is Stephen Phillips, and I'll be presenting the peer-reviewed medical literature, which contests the basis of the recommendation as shown. Can you state your affiliation, please? Dr. I'm Phillips. sorry. I'm speaking on behalf of ILADS as Thank a past you. president. And my educational background is a University of Pennsylvania, Wharton School, SUNY Health Science Center at Syracuse, residency at Yale, microbiology, immunology research, um, a portion of which was under Linda Bachenstaub. Uh, so I just said I'll be presenting the uh, peer-reviewed medical literature, which contests the underlying basis for the recommendation as shown. And in an effort to garner support for this recommendation, the guidelines review what they term the biologic plausibility of persistent infection and they assert a lack of antibiotic resistance in the genus. Um, others disagree. In fact, Ibudofre has been demonstrated to manifest antimicrobial resistance. And incongruously, in the two starred articles are actually cited by the guidelines for the express purpose of documenting antibiotic resistance. And they're written by two of the guidelines authors, highlighted in green, which is how I'll be highlighting all the guidelines authors throughout this presentation. The guidelines further claim that Lyme shouldn't be treated longer because it's not intracellular. Others, again, disagree. In fact, it's been documented within a variety of cell types. And there on the bottom, Klempner has actually documented invasion into fibroblasts, and that fibroblasts actually protect Ibudofri from otherwise therapeutic concentrations of ceftriaxone. I want to point out that much of this research is in vitro and in vivo as well. The guidelines further contend that cystic forms have no clinical relevance. Others disagree. And they state the persistence of these more resistant spirochete forms and their intracellular location may explain the long latent stage and persistence of Borrelia infection. Indeed, there is copious data, both in vitro and in vivo, that these cystic forms are critically important. In fact, they help to explain virtually all of the controversial aspects of chronic Lyme disease, such as persistence of infection, seronegativity, decreasing serologic response over time, de decreasing prevalence of spiral forms over time, and the observed phenomenon of persistent PCR reactivity in the absence of cultivability. That is because younger cystic forms may revert back into spiral forms, which can be cultured on routine media, but older cystic forms, so increased duration of illness, may not. Uh, the virulence of these forms has also been documented with animal inoculation studies where the animals become infected. In mice and dogs that are treated with antibiotics, they remain PCR and or culture positive. The guidelines claim that the significance of continued PCR reactivity remains to be better understood. In these studies, it has been somewhat clarified in that inoculation of dead borrelial DNA in uninfected dogs does not persist for more than a few days. And it's not just attenuated non-virulent infection because observable lameness has been documented after antibiotic therapy. Also, Bibidofri from treated mice are able to infect other mice. Recently, I heard some criticisms of these studies and attempt to minimize the findings. Everything from stochastic error, which is really not a problem with real-time PCR, as in the Hodgick study, to different pharmacokinetics between humans and animals, which admittedly in the mice studies can be challenging, but not so much with the dogs, to the fact well, yeah, they're infected, but they can't be sick because there's a relative lack of inflammation histologically at the site of the lesions but it would be incumbent upon those critics to mention that Bibidopra has powerful anti-inflammatory effects, and in human Lyme disease, it has been documented that, can, that there can be an almost eerie lack of inflammation despite the presence of disease. In this study cited by the guidelines, they found that 1.7% of EM patients cultured Bibidopra from the site of the prior EM. The guidelines suggest reinfection or contamination. But the notion that a tick is going to crawl up and bite somebody in the exact same spot as the first EM just in a few weeks' time is untenable at best, and I think it should be just taken off the table. It's kind of silly. Uh, contamination could be a real concern, but the fact remains that at the time that the guidelines were published, there wasn't even a single case of published culture contamination with Pibidopri. Since the publication of the guidelines, to my knowledge, there's been only one. And if you look back at Sterl's prior work, we get further clarification because he published two similar studies. In fact, they also treated EM patients and found that they were able to culture Bibidofri from the site of the prior EM. So we have one of two things. 
either uh, Dr. Sterl's work, which is these three studies published over a period of 12 years, which is rampant with contamination, yet he was somehow still invited to be a guidelines author, or that his cultures are indeed valid, which is my contention, and that, in my opinion, when he joined as a guidelines author, he probably had to uh, succumb to some pressure to criticize his own work. Some other um, pertinent findings from these studies are that between 21 and 26 percent in the two studies, these patients failed clinically and developed late symptoms of Lyme disease, and that the overwhelming majority of those, between 88 and 90 percent, were subjective symptoms only. In Dr. Steer's prior published work, which was cited by the guidelines, but these pertinent findings omitted, they found three groups of patients. The first one treated with less than a month of oral antibiotics, and they found 100 percent were synovial fluid PCR positive after treatment. In the second group, between one and two months of orals and or up to three weeks of IV, 37 percent were positive. In the third group, they were treated with multiple courses of antibiotic therapy. The characterization of these antibiotics was not defined, but the assumption is that it was somewhat more aggressive than the second group, a full 30 percent were PCR positive. Steer makes a point to write, OSPE DNA in the joint fluid indicates the presence of viable spirochetes, just like in the animal studies. Yet none of this was discussed in the guidelines, even though it was cited for other reasons. Come on. In this study, also co-authored by Dr. Steer, a long-term follow-up of patients treated for Lyme, they found that 26 percent relapsed by year one, that 34 percent had long-term symptoms, and one of the patients who was treated with two weeks IV penicillin developed severe neurologic illness despite this. She was retreated with two weeks of IV ceftriaxone, but it didn't help, and she passed away. And on autopsy, the brain tissue revealed two spirochetes um, with some mononuclear inflammation, I believe co-authored by Dr. DeRay, okay? And this was uh, cited as well by the guidelines, but these findings weren't discussed. Um, in this study, lead author Dr. Steer, they had 12 patients who failed antibiotics for Lyme and found spirochetes in the synovium of 50 percent of the patients. And I quote Steer here, that the stimulus in Lyme arthritis would appear to be a small number of live spirochetes, which may persist for years. In the next study, they had a patient also co-authored by Steer, who passed away from adult respiratory distress syndrome, which the authors attributed to Lyme disease. She failed a two-week course of tetracycline, 10 days IV penicillin, and a second course IV penicillin duration unspecified. Autopsy, lymph nodes demonstrated uh, spirochetes compatible with the Rudolfi. And uh, you'll notice in many of the studies on the bottom when I point out that they're American studies, the assumption is that they're sensor stricto, because sensor stricto is, uh, unless they travel extensively through Europe, this is the assumption. In this case of obvious Lyme disease, was treated, a girl was treated with two weeks of moxicillin, clavulinic acid, and two weeks of, excuse me, 12 days of that, and two weeks of doxycycline. Two months later, she got arthritis of the knee. Bibidoferi uh, was cultured from the synovial fluid. It was most likely sensor stricto based on the monoclonal antibody pattern. Um, in the next study, the guy had a couple years of fevers and arthralgias and rashes, positive Lyme serologies, three weeks IV penicillin, still symptomatic, and they recovered spirochetes compatible with Bibidoferi from the spleen. In this study of 33 neuroborreliosis patients who got either ceftriaxone or cefotaxime for 10 days, they found two points. One, at over eight months, 37 percent of evaluable patients were still sick. And one of the patients, which had uh, persistent fevers and headaches, whose initial pleocytosis resolved after antibiotic therapy and who was seronegative, they cultured bibidoferi from this normal-appearing CSF that didn't contain Lyme antibodies. So again, you have this constellation of presence of the organism, no inflammation in the spinal fluid, but presence of illness. And next slide. In this study of what I guess Dr. Steer referred to as Lyme refractory arthritis, four Lyme patients initially in synovial fluid PCR positive. They failed both doxycycline and ceftriax in of standard durations. And after treatment, the fluid became negative, but the PCR of the membrane was still positive. They got treated longer term, oral and IV, and they had resolution. Here we have a patient with EM and arthralgias. This is uh, Dr. Liegner's, which we went into in detail, so I'll skim it. Uh, three months minocycline essentially failed, biopsy compatible with EM, spirochete demonstrated, patients are negative, blood PCR positive, complete resolution to long term oral minocycline. Here we have a patient who had a tick bite EM, treated with two weeks doxycycline, and after the doxy, he went on to develop severe subjective disabling symptoms. He never met CDC case staff, he was always seronegative. negative. He was retreated ultimately seven more days of doxycycline and then cultured, and the rash yielded sensulato, and it was confirmed by both IFA and PCR, and the authors made a strong point to say it could not be a contaminant because they never had anything like it in their lab before. 
In this study of five Lyme patients who failed treatment, 80% of whom had received ceftriaxone or cefotaxim for two weeks, the cultures were positive for sensolato, and the majority were seronegative and did not meet CDC case definition. In this study of a woman who developed EM after camping, years later got severe arthritis, needing surgeries, ultimately diagnosed with Lyme arthritis, was seropositive. She responded dramatically to two courses of IV penicillin, three courses of ceftriaxone, and one of IM penicillin with quote-unquote dramatic reduction of arthritis, but she'd relapse every time she stopped. The doxycycline for 13 months, salpicylazine, and a synovectomy didn't help at all. I want to make a point that doxycycline has a small measurable anti-inflammatory effect, and sulfasalazine is an overt immunosuppressive drug. And those did not provide benefit, but beta-lactams, which are virtually devoid of anti-inflammatory activity, did provide benefit. And I comment on this specifically to try and rebut the so-called anti-inflammatory effect theory of antibiotics helping these patients with chronic Lyme. Again, American patients since so restrictive. Despite all these treatments, they recovered copious spirochetes in the fluid and the membrane, and it was PCR positive. Here we have patients treated um, with ceftriaxone for three-week mean, and 57% relapsed despite treatment. The relapses were all retreated, and, and they all got benefit from the antibiotics, but 71% was still, 71 were still somewhat symptomatic. One of the patients, after his three weeks of ceftriaxone, they found bubidopheri in the bladder on biopsy, and has confirmed with monoclonal antibodies. Again, American patients, sense restrictive. In this study of a woman with no history of tick bite or EM who was seronegative and CSF Lyme antibody negative, her CSF was only intermittently positive for bubidopheri immune complexes, OSPE, free antigen, and PCR. And the first two of those tests aren't commercially available. So what do you do you know, if you don't have access to these research tests? The third test obviously is that 43% of her, of her seven LPs were negative by PCR, but she was treated anyway, and she got benefit from treatment, but only after very severe exacerbations of symptoms, which the authors thought were compatible with Herxheimer reactions. This person would become stuporous and hemiparetic with the initiation of antibiotics. We're not talking mild stuff. And she ended up getting seven rounds of IV antibiotics and three years of continuous oral. And I'd like to point out that it's co-authored Patricia Coyle, who was one of the guidelines, previous authors, not the 2006, but before. Here we have patients, I'll describe two out of the three who had brain biopsy proven persistent infection. This patient number one was seronegative, CSF antibody negative, and no pleocytosis. CSF culture, bubidopre sensolato. The patient was horribly ill. Again, presence of the organism, lack of inflammation, severe illness. She was treated with three weeks of ceftriaxone, partially improved, switched over to eight months doxycycline, relapsed, PCR positive in the plasma and the marrow. Ceftriaxone was restarted, but she died and on autopsy, the brain tissue was PCR positive. Patient number two was initially IgM seropositive and IgG seronegative, and then both were seronegative despite disease progression. The CSF was repeatedly negative for Lyme antibodies and PCR, but the brain biopsy was PCR positive in three separate samples. So if this person didn't get brain biopsy, he would have very great difficulty in getting diagnosed with Lyme, and how many people get brain biopsy? He went on to fail seven weeks of ceftriaxone and almost nine months of high-dose uh, oral combinations of antibiotics. And after stopping each one, he'd have multiple relapses with recurrent brain lesions and a positive plasma PCR. After another 100 days of ceftriaxone, all his brain lesions resolved, and he remained well long-term follow-up. This woman had choroiditis two months after a tick bite and rash with initially positive Lyme serologies. After six weeks of the doxycycline, the choroiditis resolved. And the authors make a point to say that the antibody titers rapidly declined to seronegative right after the antibiotics were started, despite progression of the disease. And four weeks after the doxycycline, she developed arthritis and new EKG changes. A CSF analysis is completely negative. Ceftriaxone was started anyway, and her symptoms resolved. So it seems like a good story, except two months later, her choroiditis returned. She was treated at that time with roxithromycin and trimethoprim sulfamethoxazole, and upon starting the antibiotics, developed a severe exacerbation of, hand, of her prior hand pain, which was compatible with a Herxheimer reaction. They biopsied the flexor retinaculum, and quote, ligament tissue was found to be heavily infiltrated by spirochetes. Positive culture was for bubidorphori senso stricto. The PCR was positive, and it was amplified by southern flock. Here we have 165 patients, all initially met CDC case death, they were treated with long-term antibiotics, a median duration of 16 weeks, despite this 19% relapse clinically. And out of those that relapsed, 41% had their relapse confirmed by laboratory measures, meaning positive PCR and or culture. Three of the patients were culture positive, 
and 85% of them had received ceftriaxone as part of their treatment. All 13 patients retreated and 69% improved. One of the cultures was identified as senso stricto. Two other important points from this study. Before antibiotics, 92% of the eventual relapses were initially seropositive, but then at the time of their relapse, which was confirmed by laboratory means, only 50% were PCR, excuse me, were seropositive. So you have, again, diminishing serologies over time with documented persistent infection. The second important point is that immediately after the antibiotics, but before they relapsed, only 8% were PCR positive, but during the clinical relapse, 92% were PCR positive. So we have this increase of PCR over time that's compatible with replication rather than dead remnant DNA. And here we just have six more studies that I know I don't have time to go over, but they're all, you know, despite standard and even aggressive antibiotic therapy up to three months or more and confirmed by the culture and or PCR immunology microscopy. Here I'd like to just go over objective versus, versus subjective, a big topic with early Lyme disease. In this study, they found that there was a paucity of objective features. Only 10.8% had joint swelling, whereas there's a majority of subjective features. So I know what you're thinking. They all had everything, migraines, obviously, an objective feature, but that was entry criteria for the study. So the CDC reports that only 69% of cases of <coughs> Lyme had EM associated with it. And most people will agree that that statistic is skewed up because it's part of the reporting criteria. And Steer himself had proven from combined data from these two studies that a full 16% of the definite Lyme patients in his studies were subjective symptoms only. And there's no EM, no AV block, no uh, Bell's palsy, just subjective symptoms. I'd like to include this slide because um, I think Barbara Johnson had mentioned correctly, 11% were proven by steer in this sample to be asymptomatic Lyme disease, defined as new IgG Western blood seroconversion in the absence of any symptoms. So I'd like to extrapolate to the limit to make a point. How can some folks contend that you can't have Lyme in the absence of objective features when they prove that you can have Lyme in the absence of all features? In this study of eight Lyme disease, um, Dr. Chimiri, I'm pronouncing your name wrong. You made a good point, I think, before. Sure. Sorry, because you said, are you, is there circular reasoning in defining late Lyme disease by the presence of positive two-tiered uh, tests? When you take away that as entrance criteria and just look for um, persistent infection as the entrance criteria, like in this study of uh, patients with late Lyme disease, failed IV and the persistent infection was documented by either PCR and or immunoelectron microscopy, they found that the majority were seronegative in, in late disease. And, you know, it, it actually, there were diminishing serologies over time. They also found that there were high rates of nonspecific symptoms only, with the majority, two-thirds, having nonspecific and later disease. In this study of patients originally met CDC case definition, chronic myalgia developed, which met the strictest criteria for fibromyalgia after Lyme disease. And of the treated patients who had a muscle biopsy, 43% had a positive multiple excuse me, muscle biopsy for Lyme, and most had received repeated courses of orals and uh, one course of ceftriaxone, all were seronegative by CDC two-tier criteria. None of the labs ever contained Bibodorphi before. They were done in three separate labs. We're thinking that those PCRs are accurate. I'm just trying to underscore the caution in diagnosing not Lyme but fibromyalgia. And then I won't, I'll be brief on this. You know, it's true. The randomized controlled trials, both, controlled, uh, trials, both Clump, Crump and uh, Fallon, do demonstrate some benefits to antibiotic therapy. It's not perfect, and there are certainly recurrences with Fallon's study, but I don't understand why we are so married to ceftriaxone. I mean, nobody ever said it was a perfect therapy. In the open label trials, they focus away from ceftriaxone. And particularly in the Clarissa study, which was published only recently, they found tremendous benefits in returning patients back to their uh, quality of life. They took them off disability. And they also made a point that was a three to six month trial that how does anybody assess efficacy at 30 days or six weeks that half the patients were actually flared up, maybe presumably long, you know, exacerbated Herxheimer's and uh, longer treatment was necessary. So I'd like to recommend this proposed uh, change to the recommendation that there is convincing biologic evidence for the existence of symptomatic chronic epidurphine infection among patients after the receipt of recommended antibiotic treatment regimens for Lyme disease. Antibiotic retreatment has been proven to be beneficial in some studies, A1, but the best antibiotic regimens have not been established for this manifestation of Lyme disease. Prolonged oral antibiotic therapy can be beneficial for Lyme disease patients with persistent subjective symptoms and or objective signs, A2, 
and intravenous antibiotic therapy has been studied in RCTs, carries more risks than oral antibiotic therapy, and longer-term intravenous antibiotic, ther antibiotic therapy carries greater risks than shorter-term therapy. Physicians should discuss with their patients the risks and benefits of treatment options, as well as the risks of withholding antibiotic treatment. Clinical judgment must be the primary basis for these decisions, which should be made on a case-by-case -case basis. So I'll just in conclusion say that I presented in excess of uh, 25 studies which have documented persistent infection despite standard and even very long-term aggressive antibiotic therapy. So for the guidelines to say that there's no, con and that's not even counting the new studies that the guidelines address, because I kind of left them alone. It, to, for them to say that there's no convincing evidence is a, mis a material misstatement of fact. And I, I don't think it will be beyond the, the bounds of reasonableness to say it's an egregious misstatement of fact. And I've certainly, uh, being in the Lyme endemic area, having my practice focused on Lyme disease for the past 14 years, I've seen a lot of patients that I think have been directly harmed by these guidelines, and I thank you for your attention. Thank you for your uh, testimony, Dr. Phillips. Let me begin by um, asking you a question. Uh, you went through a lot of data quickly, but it seemed that you had a theme that there were patients who had seropositivity, and then over time became seronegative, and yet had persistent infection, which you believe is active replication of the organism somewhere in the body or many places in the body, and yet they remain seronegative with this persistent infection. Can you explain how I think that, that the crux of the issue and what is completely ignored by the guidelines, you know, cystic forms fall under the umbrella of spiroplasts. There are several forms of Bibidorphite besides spiral. Cystic have been the most published upon, but the, the reason that um, the published evidence as to why cystic forms may contribute to certain activity is that they express altered and diminished outer surface proteins as compared to the spiral forms. Cystic forms can be produced very easily in vitro by um, putting them in conjunction with either antibiotics or antibody and complement. So with treatment and or with increased duration of illness, you're more likely to have predominant cystic forms in the mammalian environment. And as those forms predominate, you're less likely to have expression of these outer surface proteins, which would easily explain the phenomenon of decreasing serologies over time. It will also explain the problems in cultivability because they don't all revert. And they actually have different um, culture requirements than their spiral parents. Uh, thank you. Are there questions from the other panelists? Uh, Dr. Lantos. Um, I think we have to distinguish two questions. One is, is it biologically plausible that there can be persistent infection, and number two is, is there a clinical benefit to prolonging antibiotic therapy? And I think with the collection of, of case series and case reports that you provided, there, you know, one can conclude from that that there's plausibility that uh, patients may have persistent infection. But the question as to whether prolonged antibiotics are helpful cannot be addressed by those, those case series because there's no control group. There's no baseline comparison. Right. What we have are the, are the, the studies randomness. which yeah. are... Well, you know, I'm struck by the fact that there were so few. I mean, um, there are a few open label trials like I presented in the two RCTs. I didn't present Clampton's study because I grew Mr. Long. I think it is uh, quite flawed statistically, and I couldn't draw valid conclusions one way or another from it. But of the small amounts of studies that we do have, there's at least a modest benefit. I think that uh, they are limited in that they're assuming that ceftriaxone is this wonder drug, and it's it's not. And that's the problem. Um, I think that they should serve as pilot studies. This is an area that should branch off into more research because these are unanswered questions. How can anybody speak with authority about this topic when the book has not fully been written? That I don't understand. So I'm not saying, yes, treat with ceftriaxone for a year. I'm actually not a proponent of long-term I, I, I am not because I think the risk-benefit ratio is, is not good at all. However, I am a proponent of long-term antibiotic therapy when you see that it's helping. There, there are ca cases where it doesn't help, and you say, well, even if the person is persistently affected, why treat if it's not helping? But the vast majority of my patients, the vast majority respond favorably to what are effectively very, very safe antibiotics. And the, um, all of the long-term oral antibiotic studies that I'm aware of, for not just the open-label trials for Lyme, but for other conditions like the studies with rheumatoid arthritis and acne and whatnot, have exceptional safety profiles. So again, from a risk-benefit perspective, in the absence of perfect data, it makes sense to do this, just risk-benefit analysis, I think. Are there other questions? We're getting short on time. OK. Uh, despite well, the fact we're getting short on time, I thank you very much thank for you your very, very much. thorough uh, review. As the chair's prerogative, we will take a 10-minute break, and we will start promptly.